Well, hey, um, I asked uh, Peter if we could just do some Q&A this morning um, because many of you don't know, but he's traveled. I don't know how many countries you've been to this year alone. Um, seven or eight. And you've gone into some pretty dangerous places, right? I, I know you shared a little bit of what Light a Candle is for everyone, but name some of the places you've been this, this year so far. Um, this year, so we started out in Iraq. We, did a, we took a bunch of medical doctors uh, over to Iraq and we helped out. I think we saw 1,350 patients over the course of two weeks and it was all doctors uh, predominantly from the US where they went over there and you know they just wanted to serve and bless these refugees and we were able to go into a camp that the UN had abandoned and we raised about $40,000 in 12 hours. God supernaturally just provided the money and we were able to do a distribution of uh, you know, winter supplies, all that kind of stuff, like a blanket, a heater, a food bag. But we were able to go in and be with people and just talk with them. You know, and I love, I love going out into the, into the crowd and talking with people because you'll meet carpenters, you'll meet you know, contractors. I met two university professors. I met a eighth grade high school. You know, we call it high school in Australia. What do you call it, middle school here? Middle school, so I met like a middle school teacher met all these people that were just regular p folks, and then ISIS came and stole everything from them. And so we were able to go out there, and that was, was January. Uh, February, we were in India. I've been to India a couple times this year. That was amazing. Um, I got to go to my, my home country, got, got to go back to Australia. That was really cool. Um, uh, Egypt was amazing. We were there uh, in the beginning of August. Uh, sorry, end of August. It was fantastic, and God just did some powerful miracles there. So kind of been around the place and then, you know, some other spots, other countries, you know, in the middle. I, I, I'm noticing that he's not going to like Hawaii or the Bahamas, you know. I mean, if I get the call, you know. Hey, amen. <laughs> and I'm going Someone's got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but literally, like, you're going into some pretty dangerous places that a lot of people are saying, hey, do not go there. And that's essentially what Light a Candle is, is you're going into like dark, dark places do you have any stories of some crazy things you've seen, you're witnessed, or I know we've shared, we've talked a little bit before about some things. Yeah, and I mean, that's a, there was a lesson that I learned actually in Egypt last year. Um, so it's so funny. The places that people think are really dangerous are normally super chill, and the places that you know, people think aren't as dangerous, like Egypt, uh, you can get, a, get into some real pickles and you need the Holy Spirit's wisdom in how to get out of it. But um, let me just tell on myself for a minute. And there was this, we're, we're in Egypt and, uh, you know, we get stopped at a checkpoint um, and it's the police. If it's the military, you, you just be yes, sir. Uh, but the police are often just scared that you're in their, you know, their zone, their jurisdiction. And so they want to escort, they, they want to just take all of your time. And you can get stuck at the checkpoint for like two hours if you're not careful. And uh, we had a 19-hour drive we had to do that day. It turned into like a 23-hour drive. And um, we pull up at this checkpoint, and, you know, and I go all gangster on this cop because he's trying to stop us. He's trying to escort us. And he's like, how do you know where you're going? I'm like, bro, I got a GPS. Like, how do you think I got here? I didn't just get lost and wound up at your checkpoint, you know. But he got really hostile towards us. And, you know, I was kind of... In that moment, I forgot to check my spirit and to test what spirit he was operating in. Was he just afraid or was he coming against me with like a, a demonic, you know, sort of overshadowing? And so because I didn't do the check, I just got real big and I started screaming at this police officer. I'm like, how dare you give me back my license? Da, 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 da. You know, I was like, don't you dare follow me and like grab my license off him, wrap, jump back in the car. And we tore off and we just ran away with the police like next to us in the car with their sirens on. And I'm like, go away. And we just booked it, you know. I turn around to my team. I'm like, hey guys, so sorry. They're like, how are you doing this? Like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, don't worry. It's just, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I came back to the States and I was talking to a mentor of mine and he said, Peter, did you ask the Holy Spirit? He said, you know, like what spirit he was operating under? I said, nope. He goes, what should you have done? Prophesied over him, you know? And that's the thing, like we have to be careful that when we get things pop up in our life that are coming against us that are offensive or you're, you, you have fear pop up in your life, you gotta remember to check in with Holy Spirit and react in the opposite spirit. So this year, 
I'd been taken to school, right? So I, I was feeling pretty bad about my, about my decision. You know, I was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. This year, we rolled up to, you know, the checkpoint. Same kind of thing happened. I started encouraging this guy. You don't have to straight up be like, the Lord says unto you. You know, you can just start, but with encouraging them, but putting your prophecy in like a nice little encouragement sandwich, you know. And so this time we rolled up to the checkpoint and, you know, like this guy's really just all up in our business. I was like, hey, no, 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 that's not, you know. And I was firm, but I was the whole time I'm like checking with Holy Spirit, like, are we good, are we good, are we good, are we good, you know. And our driver gets taken off into the office. I'm like, oh man, I gotta go grab him. But this police officer comes up and he was really making it life tough for us. And um, I've just, I realized that he was just doing his job, but he wasn't operating just doing his job. He was actually, he could tell that we, we love Jesus, you know? And so I started encouraging this guy and like, hey man, you blah, 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 as much English and Arabic as I could. And uh, the whole situation changed in about three seconds. They went from interrogating to everyone. They went, oh, just all of you get back in the car. I walked into the office. I was like, hey guys, everything's good. Grab the driver's license off the table. I'm like, we're leaving. They're like, have a good trip. And off we went. So it was a case where we could have gotten a lot, of, a lot of trouble. And if I had probably acted the way I did last year, God's grace wouldn't have been on that situation. It could have turned out really badly. But because I'd had you know, my mentor teach me what to do in that situation, I was able to react in the opposite spirit, be firm, use my street smarts, but also to diffuse the situation and actually turn it around to bless these guys. So just note for everybody here, if you find yourself at a checkpoint in Egypt, Compliment the man's mustache. You will get waved through immediately. If he's got a mustache and you're a man, just kind of do a little bit of this. And like, they'll just go. I'll remember that next time. It's true. It's all guys at the checkpoint, so it's a safe bet. Learn that's a nice mustache in Arabic and you'll be fine. I want you to share a little bit, and you hit this last time you were here, but in India, you're literally saving a lot of these girls out of sex trafficking. That's even happening in the temple. And the government of India knows about this. It's yeah, common it's been knowledge. illegal since 1989, but it still happens to today. So explain, what is that like? Like, these girls, where do they come from? And how do you guys get them? And what does that, that look like? So you remember that story I told you all earlier about that little girl that the, the mom didn't want? So a lot of those girls will wind up getting sold into forced temple prostitution. Um, and it's, it's technically illegal, but uh, under the com- current government there, they, they're going after a Hindu India. And part of a Hindu India looks like bringing back all of the temple worship. And so it's in the Bible, you know, this, this kind of worships all through history, um, but it's considered a blessing for your family. It's kind of like a good luck thing. So if your family's going through financial difficulty or something, if you give one of your daughters or one of your children as a, you know, to the gods, your family's gonna be blessed. And so these kids get sold, you know, as soon as they get their period, that's when they get sold um, into, into prostitution. And they will be abused many, many times a day um, until they're discarded. And so we go in there and we say, we see who you really are. And that, that's actually, it's interesting you asked that question because that's how we started the, the first safe house there is there was a, a pastor um, and he was preaching on Sunday and he said he would come up for ministry and this little girl walks up and she's bawling her eyes out. He says, hey, what can I pray for you for? And she says, I don't wanna die. He says, what do you mean? And he thought she might be having suicidal thoughts or something. She goes, no, 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 you don't understand. Like I got my period. I'm, next week they're gonna dedicate me at the temple. And he, he went home and he couldn't stop thinking about this little girl. He starts crying and he has given his life to protect and rescue these girls and say that he's their father. Because in India, if you, when you get a job interview, the second question you get asked after what's your name is who's your father? And if you don't have a father, you're gonna get discarded by society and you're gonna get a very low job. And so these girls in these temples we, our, our Indian crew are able to rescue them out either after they've been dedicated or preferably we find the ones that are gonna be dedicated and we, we can take them and keep them safe. And we've also had mothers who have heard through the, the grapevine that there's a safe place for their daughters. And so these mothers will make the ultimate sacrifice and they'll come and they'll leave, they'll leave their daughter with us and they say, give her a normal life. That's their prayer is just for a normal life. 
for their daughter and they'll leave and never see that child again or there's the possibility of them never seeing that child again because they just want her to be safe. And so this guy to this point in his life has rescued, I think it's over 100 of these girls. There's 35 or 40 of them at our safe house right now. Um, but he, he gets put in the hospital every couple of weeks because the elders, the village elders, they want that Hindu way of life. And so they, they hate what he does and they beat him up all the time, put him in the hospital um, because he said, not on my watch. He said, these girls aren't gonna get sold. These girls aren't gonna get trafficked on my watch. I'm gonna be their dad. I'm gonna show them Jesus. And I've gone to the safe house many, many times. And some of the girls, when I first got there, I looked like the guy that comes and pays to abuse them. So they were terrified of me. You know, they're absolutely terrified of me. They wouldn't come anywhere near me. But by the end of the second trip that I was there, they knew I was safe. And so now when we go, there's, especially some of the girls who've been there longer, they'll run up and just attach. They'll just grab me around the waist and they won't let go because they know here's someone who's safe. Here's a man who treats me like a daughter, like a princess. And they will run up and just hold on the whole time that we're there. All these little girls, they come and they're stealing stuff. They're angry. They're swearing. They're just, they're surviving, right? Like what else are you going to do if you're being abused you know, you, you learn how to survive. But when they've been in the presence of God, we have a, one of our country directors goes and worships with them because the things will happen in the presence of God that would take a lifetime to happen, but they can happen in an instant when they're around the king of the universe. And we've seen such healing take place in these girls that they've gone from what I described to sweet and kind and loving. They smile, they dance, they sing, they worship Jesus. So many of them have given their lives to Jesus and you can see it in their eyes. You know, there's been a whole lot of them that ha they now help out the younger ones who just arrived. And so they'll get up and they'll read their Bible every morning, they'll pray, you know, and then they go to school because they wanna grow up. And if you ask them, they say, I wanna help girls that were just like me. I wanna be a doctor and, and work for free and help the poor kids. You know, they're like, I wanna go and help the kid that was living in a hut on the side of the road like I was, you know, freezing every night. She's like, I'm gonna take them in and keep them safe. So that's the transformation we see from these villages. So some of the kids that are being adopted come from the temple, temple prostitution, and their lives are changed forever. You know, you said that one, you said one line that really stuck out that could be a really good message. What's your name and who's your father? And a lot of these girls, they probably don't even know who their dad is but they discover there's a heavenly father that cares about them. And that's the reason why God sent you guys light a candle to be a light. So man, I just wanna commend you and say thank you. Not everybody's called to go, and if we're not called to go, we can be called to give. And we can help send and be a part of what you guys are doing. Share with us uh, shortly like how you found Jesus. So I'm a pastor's kid. I'm surprised I haven't seen some of y'all at pastor's recovery camp. <laughs> It's funny though, because you know, part of me hates that joke because that's, that seems to be like a generational thing. And I wanna see that broken while I'm alive. Is pastor's kids are gonna grow up and run so much faster and harder after Jesus than your, like your Amen. kids? Amen, yes. That that's not gonna be a thing. So I probably should stop making that joke. But I grew up in the church and um, I was born out in the country. Um, all, of our, all of the people at my dad's church, uh, they grew corn, maize, canola, wheat, barley, you name it. 50, 60, 70,000 acres, you know, just like, as far as you can see, it's flat as a pancake. Um, and so I grew up in church. I grew up and, um, you know, I, I always kind of knew about God. You know, I was like very, I, I remember things pretty well. And so I kind of grew up knowing all, like knowing all this stuff about God. But my parents have the most extraordinary relationship with Jesus, you know? I could wake up every single morning and if I went into my dad's study, he'd be there with about four translations open and like a map or something, but he was, he was studying the word of God. And every single time I would go in there and be like, hey, can I sit with you? He always said yes. And then he would start telling me about what God had just showed him, like the revelation he just had. And I didn't know how special that was. And then every single morning, if I went into the living room, my mom would be sitting there either on her knees or sitting down with her eyes closed back like this. Bible open on her lap, and she loves Jesus. And I didn't know how rare that was until I grew up. I met all these people who say, well, my parents aren't even together. I'm like, wow, you know, and the people telling me what God is like, you know, like, he'll never leave you, forsake you, all this stuff. I'm like, of course not, my folks never did, you know. I didn't know that was a testimony. 
until I grew up and realized, oh my gosh, I grew up in the most extraordinary situation. And even with that, when I grew up, I went, out, I went to YWAM, I put a hole through the map, I went, where's the furthest point away from Australia? Ah, England, looks like I'm going back. So I went to England for outreach, we went to Indonesia. Um, I learned that God could talk on my DTS. Um, I didn't know that he spoke through anything other than his word, I heard his voice for the first time. Um, we did like treasure hunts, which is where you, you know, ask God, where are we supposed to go? And then you go out and you find the thing that he showed you. Um, and we went to Indonesia and I saw the first per person healed I'd ever seen. It was a man who'd been paralyzed on his left side for 30 years. And we prayed for him and he just got up and walked out. And we, went, we didn't know that it was 30 years thing. The entire village freaks out and gives their life to Jesus. But when I came back from that, I mean, isn't that insane? So I grew up and it was always missionaries coming to our church and I love when missionaries came because it was the only time I ever heard about God doing anything in the real time. It was always, you know, and this revival back in 19, oh, blah, blah, you know, like Azusa, 1905, you know, the Moravian revival, 100 years of, you know, but it was never, so last week God did this, but it was only when these missionaries came. And so I came back from YWAM and I had all these stories, right? And I was like, hey, let's, to my friends, I was like, let's go out. All of them said, oh, I don't know. I was like, all right, well, we can go out and share about Jesus. I'm like, oh, I don't think so. And to cut a long story short, I wound up running away from God for four years. And um, eventually at the, at the end, I, I had this experience where I looked in the mirror and I didn't recognize myself in my own eyes. And it, it scared me. And I, when I gave my life back to God, a buddy invited me. Um, and... Uh, I asked the Lord, I said, I'm gonna come back on two conditions. Number one, that you do something good with my life. Because at that point, I couldn't understand, I couldn't imagine anything good coming out of my life. And I said, the second thing is, all that stuff I read about, I want you to make it my story. And I felt in, in my heart, his Holy Spirit go, deal. And immediately I felt that hot rush of the Holy Spirit flood back into me. I started seeing like, uh, my prophetic gift expand, healing, all this kind of stuff just started happening. Um, and I can confidently say that with the exception of very few things, everything that I've read in that book, I've seen him do somewhere in the world. Um, and so I wanna encourage y'all, like if you have a son or a daughter who's currently away from Jesus, would you just stand right now really quick? Because I'm a living, I hope that's all right. I'm, I'm a living, breathing testimony that your prayers are powerful. You know what I discovered when I gave my life back to Jesus? That the church that I'd grown up going to, every Sunday that they did like a, an extended prayer time, they'd look around, is Peter here? No, all right, everyone, we're gonna pray for Peter to come back to Jesus. So we're gonna do that right now. And I wanna pray. And then when I say uh, that person, I, I want you to say, put their name on your lips because what, it's, something, it's something powerful when we declare it out loud. Amen. So Father, I thank you that nothing is too hard for you. God, I thank you that, uh, for the prayers, the faithful prayers of these parents and grandparents, for their children, for their grandchildren to come back to you. And so we just put their name on our lips right now, Lord. We pray for, and God, we, we pray that today your Holy Spirit would speak to them. Wherever they are, we declare that there is nowhere that is too far for you, that there is nothing that they've done that you cannot redeem. And so God, we declare right now that they will be coming back. God, I pray for text messages and phone calls and FaceTimes today of, hey, mom, hey, dad, how you doing? Can we, can we talk? And so, God, we declare that today. The prodigals will come home in Jesus' name. Everyone said, amen. amen. Come on. You know, <laughs> praise the Lord. I think there could be some prodigals in the house right now. And I wanna see if you would just lead. If you're here today, and you feel God's calling you back home, or you feel like you need to give your life to him. You know, you talked about four years where you weren't following the Lord at all. You know, would you Running just, as fast as I could. Would you just lead people, like, how do they make it right with the Lord? Yeah, so if that, re if that resonates with you, if you got hurt by the church, if you were disenfranchised, if you were frustrated at what you weren't seeing, when you, when you had an experience with God and then his people didn't match up, I want to apologize and say, as his people, we're sorry. And as a father, come home. And so if that resonated with you, if, you're, if your spirit's stirring right now, if you've got that nervous thing in your chest right now, um, can you just put up your hand? Because there, there, I, want, I believe that God wants to bring 
you back to him today, but I believe it's because he wants to use you powerfully and the devil has tried to pull you away from your calling because God has massive plans for you. He has a tremendous plan and a purpose and the devil's tried to steal that and today we're gonna say no. I see, I saw that hand, thank you, that's awesome. So if that's you, let's all, I, I always get saved again every time I pray this, I think it's good. Why don't we just all pray together and we're gonna join with you. If you're online and you see this, just write in the little chat box, I need Jesus. Um, and pray this with me. But Lord, I am sorry that I ran away from you. I'm sorry for the times when I've uh, done the wrong thing and sinned against you. God, I thank you that you have a huge plan for my life. And I thank you that nothing is impossible for you. So today I commit again my whole life to you. Use me for your will. And thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit that lives inside of me again now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today and you meant it in your heart, I wanna pray, pray with you later. Please come up and find me. I'll probably be out, back at the table. I would love to pray with you and just bless you and prophesy over you and just... Juicy real good. <laughs> Amen. Well, I just want to say, this is the second time I think you've been to Oasis, and you're part of family now, and man, there's an awesome God connection, I believe, that I have with you and our church has with you, and so thank you for everything you're doing with Light a Candle, and we're honored to link arms, you know, in 2024 and see what God has as well. Can we put our hands together for Peter? Amen. Yeah, y'all, thank you so much for having me. Every time I come here, I, my regular church is Bethel Church, and, and every time I come here, I'm always standing here in worship, and I look around the room, like you said today, and all I see is people with their faces lifted up, and y'all do such an incredible job of just leading people straight to Jesus and getting out of the way. As it feels whenever I come here, I don't say this everywhere I go, I promise. It really does feel like I'm, I'm a church at Bethel. It feels like I'm home. You know, obviously the goal's not for y'all to be Bethel. Your goal is to be Oasis, you know, but it's got that same heart to just love Jesus and to be obedient to him. So thank you so much. It really is a privilege to be here.